we are here with Mr. Morozov, and I would like to ask you, what do you think about the use of social media and uh, social networks in the revolutions that we've seen uh, in 2011 and in 2011? They were used. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Definitely, Look, I mean, for the first time. Uh, no, not for the first time. Uh, I, again, I think that the novelty that we associate with the use of social media as tools of platforms is somehow overhyped and overstated. Uh, so in that sense, uh, the Arab Spring hasn't really shown much new stuff. I mean, if you only talk about mobilization of people to show up at a particular event or particular rally, we've seen that happen in... Uh, you know, Colombia in 2008 when they had the rally against the uh, FARC uh, uh, partisans and guerrillas, we had something similar happen in, uh, you know, Ukraine with the use of text messaging uh, in 2004. Uh, so, I mean, it was not, and of course we had lots of examples in the Western context as well. So in terms of mobilization, I wouldn't say it was unprecedented. Uh, and I would even go further and say that Focusing just on the mobilizing aspect and what happened in the week before the uprising is very misguided. We have to go and look at what has happened in the decade before the uprising, but we also have to understand the political and social conditions that made this particular use of social media possible. If the army behaved differently, if the Muslim Brotherhood took a different position, social media may not have played the facilitating and emancipating role that it did. So the challenge for researchers and intellectuals ahead is to try to understand how social media fit within the broader political, social, cultural context of those revolutions, because clearly the emancipatory role that it played is not a given, and it's not going to be the same in another revolution where the context might be different. And that's why I would argue we didn't see something similar happen in Russia uh, in the last election just a few months ago, in part because the socio-political context was different. So uh, another curiosity that, that, I, that I have is actually, how do you think it will evolve? Because many people have said, you know, it was a special occasion, it was a special condition, and uh, it worked because of that. So it probably won't be the same when things will settle down. Uh, when you say it, you mean social media, Arab yeah, the, Spring, the use, protests? The uh, use of the social media and the integration with the official media. Yeah, again, I, I think we shouldn't underestimate the exceptionalist of it all, but also the uniqueness and the irreversibility, if you wish. Uh, the regimes are catching up very fast. Uh, they, in the Arab world, they were probably less sophisticated than the regimes that we currently face in China or Russia, where the governments have been present on social networks for years before the Arab Spring. They have invested heavily in surveillance. They have invested heavily in uh, censorship. They have tried to create their own grassroots online movements that are favorable to right. the governments and their causes. I expect something similar to happen uh, elsewhere. Uh, so in that sense, again, the liberating potential of the internet and social media uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a possibility, but we will need to work very hard. And by we, I mean those of us living in the West, because a lot of technologies for surveillance, for example, would come from our own Western companies. Right? So the question I had for people like me who think about those issues on a daily basis is what it is that we can do uh, you know, in our own backyard to ensure that social media can still play a similar role next year, the year after. And it's not a given that it will, given how concerned and scared the governments are. So, uh, you know, uh, there are, have been some journalists in Italy who said that, you know, as the people, the common people have used social media at the same way, the dictators, for, for example, could use them, you know, to, to yes. for their own propaganda, for their own means. So Maybe I was one of those people. I don't know. Right. <laughs> Surely for. <laughs> so um, one one last question: How do you think the integration of um, the two poles uh, will be in the future? I mean, the online the north and south. <laughs> the two main important um, sources: so the traditional media, even yeah. online, and the user-generated stuff. I'm not sure user-generated stuff still exists. You know, I think it's a purely constructed category that may actually be that. So I mean, I'm not sure I buy into the dichotomy and like the polls. Uh, I think very often now it's the mainstream media and 
you know, as we would call it based on the dichotomy that actually does most interesting work with regards to new media innovation. There is much more interesting innovation, at least for me, with regards to media that's happening inside the New York Times, that's happening in some of the startups of Silicon Valley. So I wouldn't necessarily stick to this dichotomy and, and, and think about how they will interact because I think we are long past that stage. I think a lot of newspapers, at least in America, and that's the region I know best, have embraced the internet, have embraced social media, they have embraced uh, those new tools. It doesn't necessarily mean that they embrace all the rhetoric that comes with that, that information wants to be free, that bloggers can be journalists, that bloggers can fulfill the roles that investigative reporters had. I mean, there are lots of ideologies and assumptions that come with those tools and platforms that I think are unhealthy and need to be examined and probably even debunked. Uh, but I think uh, in terms of substance, uh, I, I think all media have embraced the new platforms, and at least in these states, and I would expect something similar would happen in Europe, especially as uh, European newspapers start looking at platforms like the iPad and the Kindle, and they need to in integrate uh, sort of those new ways of delivery into their strategy. Okay, so one last question. What is your media diet? Uh, my media diet? That's going to be a very long question. Um, so I use, I'm a very heavy user of Kindle. I get seven newspapers a day, all of them in English, two from Britain, five from America. Uh, I get even blogs on my Kindle, to, so I actually pay for blogs to read them on my Kindle. I get probably a dozen plus magazines, uh, monthly, weekly, quarterly. I get lots of alerts from Google News on subjects I'm interested in, probably close to 100 on my iPad app uh, Flipboard. Uh, and I read them there. I follow lot, more than 2,000 people on Twitter. I organize them into lists. I read those lists on Flipboard as well. Um, I get lots of uh, alerts from Google Scholar for new academic papers that come out. Uh, I use, still use NetWipes. It's a very diverse uh, sort of, you know, because I'm in the writing business, I also need to keep abreast of all the new books published by Amazon. I get those alerts as well. So I do spend a huge chunk of my day uh, actually going through all of that. So there's no paper in there? Uh, I mean, I still read books, and I read, on paper, some books, uh, particularly books that haven't been published yet, and I need to review them. I review them on paper, so now I direct something like eight books with me uh, to Perugia. Um, but more and more it's uh, on my Kindle or on my iPad. Um, and I'm trying to think really hard. The only holdout that I can't read on my iPad, or maybe I can now, is Harper's Magazine. The rest, uh, you know, New York Review of Books and London Review of Books have been available on Kindle since January, I think, or December, actually, last year. And those were the only publications I used to read on paper, but now even they on Kindle, and the rest is available electronically. Okay, thank you so much for your time and for being with us tonight. My pleasure. All right.